today we begin a discussion of programming environment ladder diagram or LD. So in the IEC 611.31 specifications for PLCs, there are five programming languages defined. LD, which is ladder diagram, which we begin discussing today. It is a graphical language. Then there is FBD, which is function block diagram. It is also a graphical language. And then there is SFC, which is sequential function chart. It is also a graphical language. Then there is ST, which is structured text. It is a textual language. And then the fifth one is IL, which is instruction list. It is also textual, but it is deprecated, meaning it is, its use is frowned upon or discouraged. Um, it is a kind of a cryptic language that looks a lot like a CPU's instruction set assembly language. And we have to be aware of it though, because there is some old code that's written in instruction list. But for new projects, we would want to um, only make use of the first four of these languages. So why do we need different languages? Why not just choose one language and settle on that? Well, the answer is because these different languages have different strengths and weaknesses. Letter diagram, in particular, is quite intuitive, certainly for electrical engineers and for the electricians and technicians that would be wiring up PLCs and maintaining them. And so for that reason, uh, it's a good estimate that the great majority of PLC programs are written in ladder diagram, possibly with some function blocks that we'll talk about later uh, to allow various types of operations to be done more conveniently than you could do in what we'll call pure ladder diagram. But today we're just talking about pure ladder diagram. So what is that? Well, we'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, but just to talk a little bit about the kinds of functions that we might need that would kind of extend pure letter, letter diagram, it would be things like counters and timers, um, various maybe types of logic blocks like that, that would be, real, in principle, could be implemented in pure letter diagrams, we'll see, because any state machine can be implemented, at least in principle, in pure letter diagram. Um, but would be kind of cumbersome to do so, and therefore having some other kinds of programming uh, resources, like these function blocks, can make our, uh, our program look a lot more intuitive and smaller and cleaner and easily maintainable, things of that nature. So we're going to be looking at pure LD. This would be something that has no function blocks, which we'll get to in a future lecture. Right, and we've already been introduced to these ideas. You know, this is, you know, if we have a diagram that has some contacts and relays, you know, maybe this is A and this is Y, we know this represents Y is equal to A. So if we turn on the A uh, contact, engage it so that it conducts, uh, then it 
energizes the Y coil, and then whatever Y represents physically turns on. And we can implement ands and ors through series and parallel combinations of relays, right? So if we have relays A and B in series like this, this represents A and B. Or if we put them in parallel, like so, right, this represents A or B. And then we have the concept of a normally closed relay, where we put a slash across the inside of the relay symbol, and that represents something that is normally closed. And so then we, if we label that with the variable A, and then that's going to drive some coil, this implements Y is not A. All right, so the idea here is the slash represents its default state of this coil, which would be connected or closed. This is a normally closed contact. And the variable, that represents the logical condition that causes this contact to toggle. So if A becomes true, A is equal to 1, then this contact toggles from closed to open. Right? Whereas a standard contact like this over here would be normally open, not conducting. And if A is 0, it stays in that state. And then if A goes to 1, it toggles to closed. Okay, so the, no, the normally closed contact, that implements the not operation. So here you have the not operation, the or operation, and the and operation. And we know from those three operations we can build any combinational logic function. So let's start talking about combinational logic. Well, we know that any combinational logic function can be implemented uh, by looking at a truth table and then just writing out the, the appropriate min terms as a sum of products formulation. So let's say we have, we'll put here our different rows, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and say we have variables A, B and C, those are input variables, and then I'll put Y. And then we just list all the possible A, B, and C combinations. Like so. And the corresponding Y values, maybe we've got 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. So this logic function, we could write as y is the sum over a, b, and c of the products corresponding to rows, what, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Oops, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? This represents the min terms associated with those different rows. What would those min terms be? Well, for row 3, A is 0, B is 1, C is 1. So this would be not A and B and C. The next row, 4, A is 1 and B and C are both 0. So this is A and not B and not C. 6 is A is 1, B is 1, C is 0. So this is A and B and not C. And row 7, they're all equal to 1, so A and B and C. So it would be the OR of these four terms, then, that would form our logic function. So our logic function can be written as Y is not A and B and C, or a and not B and not C, or A and B and not C, or A and B and C. So in ladder diagram, 
a direct implementation of this would look as follows. Okay, we could have here A, not A. Well, let's see. So we put the normally closed symbol in there. Label this with A. And B, so and means series combination, and that's normally open. And then C, there's not A and B and C. And then for or, we put these in parallel. And we'll have three more of these contacts. And this will be again labeled A, B, and C. But we've got A and not B, so this is normally closed and not C. Okay, then we've got another parallel combination here. Oops. And labeled A, B, and C. This third term A and B and not C. So C, not C would be a normally closed contact. And then finally one more combination. Labeled A, B, and C. And this is A and B and C. So no normally closed contacts there. And then we could have this here connected to the one rail, power rail. And then out here we would go and connect to our Y coil and to the other power rail. Okay, so, right, this just shows this electrically. If you think about each of these terms as corresponding to a contact, a relay contact, we've got four different paths that power can flow from the rails through the coil, right? And those being in parallel like this, that represents the or. I can go this way or this way or this way or that way. And for any one of those particular paths to conduct, we have to have the uh, these three factors here all have to be true. So like for this, this row here, we need to have A is one, B is zero, C is zero. So then a toggles from open to closed, and B and C are already closed, and therefore that creates a closed path from the power rails through the coil. Now we're going to use a very convenient online PLC simulator, app.plcsimulator.online, which allows us to play around with ladder diagrams and examine their behavior. Uh, and it's very convenient, easy to use. So we'll talk about other simulation tools later, but this is a great way to get started. Okay, so we go to this website, and we can then start to drag elements from the toolbox here. Let's say we have a contact. We drag it down. Um, and let's, let's start off with, maybe we'll do three contacts. And then we can drag a coil down over there. And let's make this A and B and C is equal to Y. Okay, so if we click on one of these contacts, input parameters, oh, we don't have any. We need to add Boolean variables in the variable list. Oh, here over here is the variable list. Here we can add a new variable. Let's add A, B, C, and Y. Notice here we have variable types Boolean, number, counter, time, and timer. We'll come to those later. Right now we're just going to be using booleans. Okay, so here we now uh, have Y. So A, B, C, and Y. Now we can come over to our contacts and we can select our inputs A, B, and C for our contacts and then our coil, oops, Y. Okay, so this should implement Y is equal to A and B and C. Well, we can run it and see how that works. Now notice over here we can change the value of A, B, and C from false to true by just clicking on these values. And you see over here that it turns green. Or I can just click directly on the letter diagram. So now A and B are both true, but C is false. Right? So we don't have a path to energize the coil. But if I click on C, now I got A, B, and C. Notice 
Now we got green all the way across and Y is energized. So Y is true. So if any of these are false, Y becomes false. All right, let's, uh, so let's stop that. Now, if we want to um, put things in parallel, right, if we take one of these uh, relays and we can come up here and create a branch. Now, what I'm gonna do is drop the, I'll drop the, uh, the B inside here. Okay, now I got a branch that expands across all three A, B, and C, and then I could put more relays down here. Okay, and now let's actually look at our logic function. Let's see, that had four um, products, not A and B and C, so I want this to be not A and B and C, so we come over and click on there, and we notice here, this is your normally closed contact, this is a normally open contact. These we'll talk about later, a so-called one-shot positive and one-shot negative. We'll come to that in a future lecture. Okay, so we want that to be not A and B and C. Let's see, our next term was A and not B and not C. So we make this A. So like B, and then we want it to be not, so we use normally closed. And then here, it's going to be C and normally close, okay? All right, so we see here when we run this, if they're all, let's say A, B, and C are all false. Okay, um, so the not B and the not C are closed, because that's their default state. If we just need A to become true, and if we do, then, yeah, the coil is energized. Right? Alternately, when A is false, then the not A uh, contact here is conducting is, is closed we need b and c to become true for y to be energized and there we go now y is energized all right to then get the rest of our uh, logic function we'll just make another parallel branch oops with three contacts and while we're at it let's do that again because we need four products oops gotta be careful about how you drag these okay let's see for our third product we have a and b and not c so a and b and not C, so we select C and make it a not. And then we have for the final one, it's A and B and C. So just A and B and C. Okay, so there is our logic function. Each of these rows here, these branches, they implement a particular product, not A and B and C, A and not B and not C and so on. And then by being in parallel, that's an or of those products. Okay, so let's run this. And we can look here. This is nice because it shows us which contacts are connected. So let's go back and set A, B, and C all false. Okay, so we get no output if they're all false, but we can see when they're all false, then the not A, the not B, and the not C contacts are conducting. They're closed. So we would need to have either A becomes true, and then we energize our contact, uh, or B and C could become true, and etc. So we can, it's very nice because we graphically see what's going on here. Okay, so that is an example of implementing an arbitrary combinational logic function in ladder diagram in principle. You just have one contact for each one of the input variables. And a product then would be just a series of those. So in this case, we have three inputs, so a series of three contacts. We can negate those, make them normally closed or normally open to be unnegated. And then for each one of the products, additional products we want to sum together, we'd make a parallel branch and put the uh, contacts 
in that. Now, it, uh, it may be inconvenient to have lots of these parallel paths, and it may sometimes be the case that each one of these paths, or at least a few of them, may have some physical significance that may be of use later. Maybe you want to make use of the logic variable corresponding to a single product, or maybe you want to be able to monitor those individual products or, or what have you, depending on the physical significance of those different relays. So another approach to this would be to use local variables to represent each of these products. So we could say, remember that these came from the rows of a particular uh, truth table. So let's call this row three, four, six, and seven. So we could have, say, a new variable R3, which is not A, and B and C, and R4, which is A and not B and not C, R6, which is A and B and not C, All right, so this is just right there, and R7, the last product, which is A and B and C. And then we could write Y is R3 or R4 or R6 or R7. Of course, the oring of four variables like that would require us again to have these four four different paths in parallel they'd each just have a single relay corresponding to these values so another approach then is to negate this not y is the negation of this sum or this four input or what becomes a four input nor and now we can use one of De Morgan's laws to rewrite this as, remember, not or is equal to the and of negated variables. So this is equal to not R3 and not R4 and not R6 and not R7. So this would be another way we could implement this. Uh, so let's take a look at that in the PLC simulator. And here we are back in PLC simulator. So uh, we've got our A, B, C, and Y. So now let's create these new variables to represent the different rows in the truth table. We've got R3, R4, R6, and R7. And now we could do the following. Let's put uh, Drag three relays on here and one coil. And remember, for logical purposes, the coil is just an output variable and the contacts, uh, I, I call them relays, but they would be really the contacts of a relay. Um, those are just the input variables. Okay, so our first row three is not A. So A, and we negate it and B and C. Okay, and that's gonna implement row three. So over here, for the coil, I'm gonna choose R3. Okay, so there is a logic function just for row three. Now I can put in a new um, uh, rung here of my ladder and do that again, okay? So with different uh, normally closed, normally open values. So we have A and not B and not C. And we'll have a coil here, output, it'll be R4. All right, and then we do that for the next two rows, A, B, and C. And let's see, those are A and B and not C, so C has to be negated. 
And finally, we've got A and B and C for row seven. And uh, on that previous one, I need to put my coil out here for row six. And then I need a coil for row seven. That's A and B and C. Okay. And now recall that we're going to implement the final output as an AND of the negation of these four row variables. So we're going to have not R3, not R4, not R6, oops, not R6, and not R7. Now that's going to be not Y. Okay, so how do we implement that? Get this guy over here. Okay, so this is going to be y and notice here this is a negated coil so let's select that notice it's got the little slash in there so that means it's normally closed so right, our convention is that when the variable that is assigned to a contact or a coil when that is false then the contact or coil stays in its uh, default state in this case this would be the uh, let's see, let's go up here. So this C would be, this contact would normally be closed in conducting. It's only when that variable becomes true that you toggle that. So for up here, if C becomes one, that would toggle this to going from normally open to being closed. Down here, it would toggle this from being normally closed to being open. Okay, so same thing is true for coils. They can be normally closed. They're normally on, normally energized. And then when, if these variables are such that this allows this uh, this branch here to energize the coil Y. That means to make the variable Y true, then it toggles the state of this coil. So it becomes from normally closed, it becomes open. Okay, so let's run this. So if we have A and B and C, let's see. So let's make, let's click this. Now A and B and C are true. Notice what happens. That makes row seven true down here. That makes not row seven false. It means that this, this stays, uh, toggles from normally closed to open. So this opens and that unenergizes the coil. That makes Y false. But then the default state of that coil is to be conducting, to be closed. It's normally closed. So this lights up green, meaning that the, if this was a motor or something, that would turn on. Okay, so if we go back, uh, now let's see over here. So say A is one, B is one, and C is zero. So C is false, so true, true, false. That makes uh, the row six coil true. And now that acts down here as a contact. So R6 is true. That toggles this normally closed contact to be open. And again, that breaks this energizing uh, connection to the coil. And so Y is false but again when y is false this is a normally closed coil so it would conduct okay and likewise for the other you know the other rows okay so that might be a more attractive way to implement the logic function especially if later on we could make use of these these variables r3 r4 r6 and r7 for some other operation all right we don't have to then repeat what's already been done or it also might be something where we want to, maybe for some reason we want to, you know, who knows what the, the physical significance of these would be in an application, but we may want to monitor one or more of these for some other reasons. And so this kind of approach can allow you to do that. Now you might ask, well, what about logic function minimization? Right, we, we've said throughout this course that a straightforward sum of products implementation of a logic function is often not going to be minim minimized. Uh, and so it's not going to be 
optimal in the sense of using the smallest number of resources. And certainly, yes, we would still want to do logic function minimization in this case. We've got three, three variables. A and B, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, and C, zero, one, here are rows, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We've got ones in three and four, three and four, and six and seven. Yes, we could certainly do a better job of implementing this as far as using fewer resources. Um, you know, and there's some different ways we could do that. We could take these two groupings. We could also have had this vertical um, column. But if we do that, let's see, what is this first one? This is A is 1 and C is 0. So this is A and not C. Or down here, we've got C is 1 and B is 1, or B and C. Okay, so we could have implemented this as just Y is A and not C or B and C. Let's take a look at that. So here we are back with our, kind of what's called the brute force uh, ladder diagram implementation of that logic function. Um, that was this, this truth table here. It just says this sum of four or terms uh, and now our claim is we can make a new version that is much simpler it's just a and not c or b and c okay so we've got a and not c a and not c or B and C. Okay, and that should give us the same output Y. Uh, let's let's create a new variable called X, we can, so that we can compare X and Y. They should be the same. Uh, but if we put Y down here, then we'd have kind of a wouldn't be able to. If they were different, we wouldn't be able to see that. Okay, oops, and this should have been X, sorry. There we go. Okay, and we can run this. Here's our A, B, and C. Let's make them all false. Okay, let's make, uh, let's see. So we can see that if A is true and C is false, then they should both be on. Yes, they are. Because if A is true and C is false, notice these two branches here. They've got A and not C, and then one's got not B and the other has B. So there's one of our identities. We could factor out the A and not C, and then you've got B or not B, and of course B or not B is equal to one. So that reduces down to A and not C, um, which is this first line here. And likewise, then if we go down here, let's have B and C true, but A false, and they both turn on. And why is that? Here, the top and the bottom branch have both have B and C in common, and then one has not A and the other has A. So again, we could factor that B and C out, and then you've got A or not A, which is one, so you just got the B and C. All right, so this is kind of a visual uh, confirmation of what we're doing when we go and do our K-map minimization. I guess it's the idea of doing this factoring, and we can see that factoring here physically by just looking at these different branches that have two of the relays in common, and then the other relay, we've got the normally open and normally closed version of that. And those are redundant. So we can see that it is indeed the case. So yes, we still want to use all of our logic minimization techniques when we're working with PLCs, although we, we don't have to, of course, we could, we could have this implementation. Uh, but this is going to be take up less space on the logic diagram. Now we're not creating actual physical contacts when we do this. It's just the logical calculation. And so in the microcontroller that runs the PLC, it's a very simple type of calculation. So it's not going to add a whole bunch of time, but 
again, I'd rather have this simple ladder diagram than this more complicated one. Um, and it really emphasizes what the relation between A, B, and C are that cause the output to become true. Let's look at another example. Say we have four uh, input variables, and we define our logic function as the sum over A, B, C, and D, the min terms corresponding to rows 1, 3, 7, 9, 11, 12, and 14. Okay, we could just go through and write out the min terms for a four input truth table. We'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those we'd have to implement. But of course, as we just said, we still want to do our minimization operations. Okay, so we make a four variable K map. A and B here, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, and C and D over on the side, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. The corresponding two table rows are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15. So we've got rows 1, 3, 7, 9, 11, 12, and 14. There we go. And so we look for blocks. Uh, let's see, we can find a four cell block right here with wraparound. What would that be? Uh, let's see. So. A is 0 and 1, so that's not involved. So B is 0, so this is not B. And then what about uh, the rows here? Uh, C is 0 or 1, so that's not going to be involved in the logic function. D is equal to 1. So this is not B and not D is that block. Okay, then that leaves these three cells. Let's see, we can find, connect these two by wrapping around top and bottom. So what would that be? A is 1, B is 1. So that's A and uh, B. And then what else? Let's see, the top and bottom row, that's where D is equal to 0. C is 1 or 0, so that's C is not going to be involved. So A and B and not D would be that. That leaves this one cell right there. And for that, we could put it in this block. And what would that be? Well, that's... C and D are both one, and then this is the two columns with A is equal to zero. So not A and C and D. So with a little minimization, we see that our logic function Y can be written as not B and D, or A and B and not D, or not A and C and D. So let's go implement that with ladder diagram. All right, so let's see. Our logic function is we need A, B, C, and D, and we're going to have uh, three parallel um, parts of the circuit there. So let's uh, define Variables A, B, C, and D, and then output variable Y. And let's see, our first logic function is not B and D. So there we go, this is going to be not B and D. Okay, and then we, we have that ORed with A and B and not D, so that's going to be, oops, in parallel. A and not B 
a a and b and not d sorry a and b and not d and b not and then not a and c and d okay so another parallel branch Oops, move that to the wrong space there. Let's just make sure. Not B and D, A and B and not D. Okay, and now we've got three here, and that's going to be our not A, C, and D. And then we need our output coil for the Y. And now we could run that and we can see right b not b and d turns it on uh not a and c and d or a and b and not d okay so we can verify our truth table in that manner uh, and there's our minimized logic function Now we know there are two types of logic for our purposes. There's combinational logic, which does not involve time in any way or any sequence of events. And then there is sequential logic, which requires us to keep track of some sequence of events. In other words, there's a time dependence. And kind of our overall paradigm for sequential logic is the state machine. So, we're going to show now that you can implement any state machine in pure letter diagram. And for this, this purpose of this, let's look at an example that we've worked out previously, which is the problem of filling a water tank. So we've got this water draining out the bottom. But then we've got a pump up here, which can more water and fill the tank that comes from some source down here so this is pump P and we've got two water level indicators one here H the high level and another one L the low level when we are the water is above the level this outputs the sensor outputs a zero, and when we're below the level, it outputs a one. Likewise here for the lower level uh, sensor. So remember the reason that this problem required sequential logic was that the state of the pump, when we're in this region here where H is one, we're below the high level, and L is zero, we're above the low level, is not simply a function of these inputs H and L, but depends on the, how we got there. If we were starting out where H and L were both zero, we were, we were up here above the high level line and we were draining down and then H turned on to H is equal to one when we went below the high level, then we would want to continue with the pump off so that we continue draining until we go down below the low level. Now when H is one, L is one, we turn on the pump and we start to fill up. As we do, we go above the low level, and now L goes to zero. We're back in this region, H is one, L is zero. But now we're coming from the filling operation, so we keep the pump on and, until we fill up and then turn it off and then repeat the cycle. So the, the state of the pump, when we're in this region here where the water levels between the, the high and the low marks, depends on how we got there, right? So that means it's going to be a sequential logic function. And we work this out. In terms of a state machine, also we used a latch to solve this problem, a, an asynchronous type of sequential logic. But we're going to focus on uh, synchronous sequential logic in the form of a state machine here. So we worked this out that the excitation function, that is the input to the D flip-flop, this, this is a two-state machine. Either the pump is on or off. So we need one flip-flop to record a, the value of one or zero there for that output. So... 
the excitation, the D input of the flip-flop function we saw was L and not Q, where Q is the output of the flip-flop, uh, or H and Q. So that would give us the next Q value. And then the output, P, is just equal to the value of Q. Q, just the flip-flop output, just holds the state of the pump on or off. Okay? So how could we implement this? Well, so where does the time element comes in? Well, this comes from the fact now that we talked about that we have these different um, tasks running. Remember, there's a an init, we'll just call it init task that we run up front when we first power up our PLC. Then we go into this at least two other tasks, slow task and fast task. And the fast task can either loop back on itself and repeat you know, whatever its defined period is until we've reached the period of the slow task. And in that case, then we go from the fast task back and we do the slow task and then go back into the fast loop. And in the fast loop, we can usually... Um, We'll talk more about this later. Usually, we can modify the period of that, and so we can make essentially the clock frequency that would correspond to how fast we go through our PLC ladder diagram. Um, we can make that anything we want. Okay, so we can set the clock frequency. So all we need to do then is just implement these combinational logic functions, and then the sequential nature of it comes because we're in sequence running this one time after another, and by modifying the, the period of the fast task, we can effectively make that clock cycle whatever we want, at least down to some minimum value based on how fast the PLC can run. Okay, so all we need to do then is implement this in ladder diagram and let it run repeatedly. So let's take a look at that. So here we are back in PLC Simulator. So let's see, what were our, our variables? We need the L and the H a sensor will be our inputs. And let's go here and let's actually, let's call that low, uh, high and low. And then the output's gonna be P for the pump. And then we've got the D and the Q variables associated with our flip-flop. Okay, so let's first implement the excitation logic, the D, the flop input. It's L and not Q, or H and Q. Okay, so L, low, and not Q. Okay, so not, we need a normally closed type of contact. And now we put a parallel branch here. And so L and not Q, um, and H and Q, or H and Q. Okay, so we put two of these guys, H, which is high, and Q. All right, and that's going to be our excitation function, D. Okay, let's make a new branch. Uh, a new rung, all right, and now we go to the next calculation. We're now going to store that excitation D into the Q output. Okay, so we just come down here. We've got D is now assigned to Q. So that's the flip flop operation, and we have the output. function P, the pump, is equal to Q. Q right here. And there's the pump. Okay, so let's, uh, let's run this. Remember how this should behave. Oops. We should, uh, if we start off with H and L both equal to zero, that means the tank is full and it starts to drain. 
H turns to 1 and the pump stays off. And then when L goes to 1, then the pump turns on. Now it starts to fill, and then L goes to 0, but the pump stays on until H goes to 0 also. So let's, let's verify that. Let's start running this. Okay, so they're both false, meaning we're in the high level state. Okay, so now H, first we, we drop down below the high level, so H goes to 1, so H becomes true. And the pump stays off. Then we go down below the low level, and now low becomes true. And notice what happens. So the excitation function is 1. That gets stored in the Q output of the flip-flop, and then that turns on the pump. Now as we go, and the level starts to rise, as you pump fill it, L goes to 0. But the low goes false, but notice the pump stays on. And we continue to fill until H goes to zero. Now we're above the high line there. And so H becomes false, and now the pump turns off, and we repeat the cycle. Now, when you look at this, you could say, well, this middle rung here is kind of redundant. We're assigning this logic function to a variable D and then just copying that to a variable Q and then using that to assign that to pump. We could just put, couldn't we just put pump right here? Let's take a look at that possibility. So we can just replace uh, this D here, stop this guy, uh, D with just pump. Uh, for now, let's get, let's get rid of this. Uh, we could get rid of this whole rung here and this whole rung. Let's see, now Q, Q is, my pump is equal to Q, so couldn't this just be pump? And this also pump, would that work? Let's try it out. Okay, so we start off with uh, both sensors false and the pump off, we're up here in the full state. We go down below the high level, H goes to true, to one. Pump stays off, so we continue to drain, and then we go down below the low level, and L goes to 1. And now the pump turns on. Okay, so now moment of truth, we start to fill up, and we go above the low level, and L goes to 0, and the pump should stay on. And it does, until we go up, and we now go above the high level, so both L and H are false, and then the pump shuts off. So this, this works. This, in fact, is just the latch solution that we first looked at in the context of this problem. So yeah, this is an implementation of a latch, which is a type of sequential logic. Now, the reason that this would work as sequential logic is because in the PLC, this letter diagram, say as part of the FAST task, would be running repeatedly in sequence, one after the other. And so changes in... The sensor outputs, the low and the high sensor outputs, then could take the previous value of pump, which would be applied to these two contacts, uh, and change the value of pump. Right? So that's why it would be a sequential system. So our solution that we had before in terms of the state machine is a bit redundant. Yeah, that's true. This is a simple enough problem that we could solve it without a formal state machine. But in more complicated problems, the state machine approach can be uh, very effective. And we might want to keep in those D and Q values because we may want to make use of those for different, more complicated types of calculations of, say, the output. OK, so let's go back to that. OK, here we are back with our state machine solution. So again, we've seen, in this simple case, these last two rungs are a little bit redundant. But leaving them in, which is perfectly OK, uh, just emphasizes that this is a state machine solution. And so for more complicated problems, that can be very effective. So we would have three blocks of logic, at least formally. We'd have the excitation logic that determines one or more D inputs to flip-flops. Then we would have the flip-flop operation where we would latch these D values into the Q outputs. 
And then we would have the output logic, which would control our output variables. Now here's where, uh, you know, we may want to keep the actual Q values because maybe the uh, we have multiple outputs and therefore it's not quite, and these, these may not map simply in this case, Q is just equal, pump is just equal to Q. So they are kind of redundant in that sense. But we have might have more complicated expressions that would take our inputs and our flip-flop outputs to produce our output variables. And so they may not be quite as trivial as in this it's a very simple case. Let's look at another state machine problem. We worked this out in a previous lecture. So this was a three state state machine. Okay, so state one, two, and three. And we made a state assignment. We obviously have more than two states, so we need more than one flip-flop. We need two flip-flops at least. So we made state assignments. The first state was 0, 1. The second was 1, 0. And the third was 1, 1. And our transition uh, characteristics were that if we're in state 1 and we have input A and output Y, that if the input A is 0, the then we stay in that state and the output is zero. If we're in that state one and the input is one, we output a zero and move to state two. If we're in state two and A is one, we stay in that state and output zero. And then if we're in state two and the input is zero, we move to state three and output a zero. And in state three, if the input is one, we stay in state three and output a one. Otherwise, if the input is zero, we output a zero and move back to state one. So we worked this out in a previous, previous lecture. And what we found was for the excitation functions, D zero was not A or Q0 and Q1, and D1 was A, or not Q0 and Q1, and the output logic function was A is, uh, I'm sorry, Y is equal to A, and Q0 and Q1. Okay, so let's look at this in the PLC simulator. So here we are, we need to define our variables, input A, output Y, and then we've got excitation D0 and D1, and flip-flop outputs Q0 and Q1. Okay, and these last two define the, the state. So we begin with our excitation function D0. Let's see, that's not A or, Q1 and Q0. So here we are with not A or uh, Q0, or well, Q1, either way, Q1 and Q0. And that gives us our excitation D0. Okay, now we have the next, oops, didn't want that. Now we have the next excitation. Uh, for D1, it's A or Q1 and not Q0, so similar type of structure. So A and Q1 or not Q0, and that's going to produce D1 excitation. And we'll assign an excitation signal, D0, 
goes to Q. Zero. Oops, keep doing the wrong, hitting the wrong button there. Uh, D1. Goes to Q1. And we need a little more space. Let's zoom out. And now, finally, the output is an AND of three functions. A and Q1, Q0. That gives us our Y. All right, let's run this. So we start it and we get into state zero, 01. Q1 one is 0 and Q0 zero is 1. So state zero, 01, right? That's, that's the state here. And A is 0, so we just stay in that state and output Y is equal to 0. So we stay in that state. Now we're going to make A true. Oh, we switch over now into the state where Q1 is 1 and Q0 zero is 0. That's state 1, 0. That's this state right here. And A is 1, so we just stay in that state and keep, out, keep outputting a 0. Now if we make A equal to 0, uh, we should transition over to state 1, 1. But you notice here there's a little bit of a trickiness because if we stay with A is equal to 0, we immediately transition from that state back to state 0, 1. And this simulator runs fast enough, I probably won't be able to catch that. So if I make this go to 0, it uh, went very quickly th through state 1, 1 and back to state 0, 1. So there we are in state 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, so that's a little bit of a trick in using this to simulate a state machine is that if you have a situation like this where the same input's going to cause two subsequent transitions, I won't be fast enough to catch that first transition. So if we had changed this to be a 1 uh, that would cause us to transition, then we would have something where we would have to toggle A every time we wanted to transition. Okay, so other, a little more sophisticated um, PLC simulators will be able to deal with this, or you can make the refresh rate, the, the basically the period of the fast uh, task slow enough that you can actually see that transition occur. So that's just a little caveat. And again, re recall that we're just going through and, and formally writing out the uh, model, the ladder diagram model of a state machine. So we have these formal assignments of this excitation to the, the D's to the Q's. And as we've seen previously, uh, it may be possible to get rid of that and just directly do the assignment uh, up here and, and drop these two branches. However, you have to be careful because a potential issue is, you'll notice here, um, in this case, the, the D0 excitation, which is going to then go into the Q, be stored in the Q value, Q0 value, depends on both the Q0 and the Q1. Okay. And then when we go to the next uh, rung here, the D1 excitation, that depends on the Q0 and the Q1 values. But if I just change the Q0 value up here, so I replace this D0 by Q0, that would change the value that's going to appear here, and that would give me a different behavior, potentially, than what I'm really expecting. So the idea is that we reason we break up the excitation and then the, the final assignment to the Q outputs is because we may need to make use of those Q values, the previous Q values, in calculating this excitation. Then we make the assignments that give us the new Q values, the Q0 star and the Q1 star, and then we go on from there. So that's when you would have to be careful about that and use this, this formalism. Don't assign the Q values until you've made use of all the Q values in your logic functions. So what we've described so far, we'll call 
secure ladder diagram. And we can say now, here, put it like this, pure LD can implement number one, any combinational logic function or functions. And two, any finite state machine. And since, in principle, any computer program can be cast into the form of a finite state machine, in principle, you could use pure ladder diagram, right, which just uses um, contacts and relays in order to implement any computer program. It could be considered a general computer programming language. Yeah, that's in principle. Uh, in practice, state machines, um, when you start to have lots of states, can get very complicated to analyze. And implementing even relatively simple ideas, things like timers and counters and the like, um, would become prohibitively difficult with a pure state machine implementation. So in practice, we want to add useful function blocks. Uh, these would be things like timers, counters, uh, things we'll call one shots. We'll see the usefulness of these things later. Um, you could even have more complicated devices that might be some kind of form of motor controller or something like that that would be really, really difficult to actually implement and, and program out in pure ladder diagram, um, but get used a lot so that we would like to have these pre-made function blocks that we can just drag into our program and make use of. So this is kind of like in a regular programming language where you say if there's a per certain type of operation you want to do repeatedly, you write a function that implements that operation, and then you just call the function every time you need it. Similar idea. And so this is why um, all PLC programming uh, implementations of ladder diagram are not limited to pure ladder diagram, but also include these various types of function blocks that we'll start studying next time. Still, just pure ladder diagram itself can solve a wide variety of problems, and especially relatively simple problems. And so it forms the basis of most, in practice, most PLC programming. And because it is relatively, or at least can be set up to be relatively intuitive uh, to anybody looking at the code, understand what's going on, um, it is very attractive for that reason. Uh, the maintenance and sharing of different PLC programs then becomes much simpler than it would be if it was more of an esoteric programming language, something like that. Nonetheless, there are situations where ladder diagram, even with the function blocks, becomes a little clunky, so to speak, and we might want to have some different types of approaches to, um, especially at, the, at high levels, controlling the program flow and things of that nature. And so that's just, this is why we have the other types of programming paradigms, like function block diagram and, and sequential function chart, and also the kind of general programming language. It's more like a, a traditional programming language, which is uh, structured text. So we'll, we'll touch on all of these different types of programming environments as we go through the course. 
But the big main emphasis, especially in this introductory course, should be on ladder diagram.